Labor Hulies by Agatha Christie Audiobook 4x16 I'm not one to go listening to doors, and you've no right to say I did. I don't know I don't know nothing. Poirot said. Have you ever heard of poisoning by arsenic? 33 A nicker of quick furtive interest came into the girl's sullen face. She said. So that's what it was in the medicine bottle R9 what medicine bottle? Beatrice said. One of the bottles of medicine what that Miss Moncrief made up for the missus. Nurse was all upset I could see that. Tasted it, she did, and smelled it, and then poured it away down the sink and filled up the bottle with plain water from the tap. It was white medicine like water, 88 anyway. And once, when Miss Moncrief took up a pot of tea to the missus, nurse brought it down again and made it fresh. Said it hadn't been made with boiling water but that was just my eye, that was. I thought it was just the sort of fussing way nurses have at the time but I dunno it may have been more than that. Poirot nodded. He said. Did you like Miss Moncrief, Beatrice? I didn't mind her. A bit standoffish. Of course, I always knew as she was sweet on the doctor. You'd only to see the way she looked at him. Again Poirot nodded his head. He went back to the inn. There he gave certain instructions to George. Six Drive. Alan Garcia, the home office analyst, rubbed his hands and twinkled at Hercule Poirot. He said. Well, this suits you, M. Poirot, I suppose. The man who's always right. Poirot said. Rubbed his hands and twinkled at Hercule Poirot. He said. Well, this suits you, M. Poirot, I suppose. The man who's always right. Poirot said. Is this true? Is this really true, M. Poirot. He put her gently into a chair. Yes. More than sufficient arsenic to cause death has been found. Nurse Harrison cried. I never thought. I never for one moment thought. And burst into tears. Is this true? Is this really true, M. Poirot? He put her gently into a chair. Yes. More than sufficient arsenic to cause death has been found. Nurse Harrison cried. I never thought. I never for one moment thought. And burst into tears. Anything in it. It was just queer. I knew there was something, said Poirot. You had better tell it to me now. It isn't much. It's just that one day when I went down to the dispensary for something, Jean Moncrief was doing something rather. Odd. Yes. It sounds so silly. It's only that she was filling up her powder compact a pink enamel one. Yes. Nine I if but she wasn't filling it up with powder. With face powder, I mean. She was tipping something into it from one of the bottles out of the poison cupboard. When she saw me she started and shut up the compact and whipped it into her bag and put back the bottle quickly into the cupboard so that I couldn't see what it was. I dare say it doesn't mean anything. But now that I know that MRS. Oldfield really was poisoned. She broke off. Poirot said. You will excuse me. He went out and telephoned to Detective Sergeant Gray of the Berkshire Police. Hercule Poirot came back and he and Nurse Harrison sat in silence. Poirot was seeing the face of a girl with red hair and hearing a clear hard voice say. C.C. Don't agree. Jean Moncrief had not wanted an autopsy. She had given a plausible enough excuse, but the fact remained. A competent girl. Efficient. Resolute. In love with a man who was tied to a complaining invalid wife, who might easily live for years since. According to Nurse Harrison, she had very little the matter with her. Hercule Poirot sighed. Nurse Harrison said. 
What are you thinking of? Poirot answered. The pity of things. Nurse Harrison said. C.C. Don't believe for a minute he knew anything about it. Poirot said. No. I am sure he did not. The door opened and Detective Sergeant Gray came in. He had something in his hand, wrapped in a silk handkerchief. He unwrapped it and set it carefully down. It was a bright rose-pink enamel compact. Nurse Harrison said. That's the one I saw. Gray said. Found it pushed right to the back of Miss Moncrief's bureau drawer. Inside a handkerchief sachet. As far as I can see there are no fingerprints on it, but I'll be careful. With the handkerchief over his hand he pressed the spring. The case flew open. Gray said. This stuff isn't face powder. He dipped a finger and tasted it gingerly on the tip of his tongue. The door opened and Detective Sergeant Gray came in. He had something in his hand, wrapped in a silk handkerchief. He unwrapped it and set it carefully down. It was a bright rose-pink enamel compact. Nurse Harrison said. That's the one I saw. Gray said. Found it pushed right to the back of Miss Moncrief's bureau drawer. Inside a handkerchief sachet. As far as I can see there are no fingerprints on it, but I'll be careful. With the handkerchief over his hand he pressed the spring. The case flew open. Gray said. This stuff isn't face powder. He dipped a finger and tasted it gingerly on the tip of his tongue. Being the same case. Yes. I'm positive. That's the case I saw Miss Moncrief with in the dispensary about a week before MRS. Oldfield's death. Sergeant Gray sighed. He looked at Poirot and nodded. The latter rang the bell. Send my servant here, please. George, the perfect valet, discreet, unobtrusive, entered and looked inquiringly at his master. Hercule Poirot said. You have identified this powder compact, Miss Harrison, as one you saw in the possession of Miss Moncrief over a year ago. Would you be surprised to learn that this particular case was sold by Messrs. Woolworth only a few weeks ago and that, moreover, it is of a pattern and color that has only been manufactured slash or the last three months. Being the same case. Yes. I'm positive. That's the case I saw Miss Moncrief with in the dispensary about a week before MRS. Oldfield's death. Sergeant Gray sighed. He looked at Poirot and nodded. The latter rang the bell. Send my servant here, please. George, the perfect valet, discreet, unobtrusive, entered and looked inquiringly at his master. Hercule Poirot said. You have identified this powder compact, Miss Harrison, as one you saw in the possession of Miss Moncrief over a year ago. Would you be surprised to learn that this particular case was sold by Messrs. Woolworth only a few weeks ago and that, moreover, it is of a pattern and color that has only been manufactured slash or the last three months? George stepped forward. Yes, sir. I observed this person. Nurse Harrison, purchase it at Woolworth's on Friday the I-A-T-H. Pursuant to your instructions I followed this lady whenever she went out. She took a bus over to Darnington on the day I have mentioned and purchased this compact. She took it home with her. Later, the same day, she came to the house in which Miss Moncrief lodges. Acting as by your instructions, I was already in the house. I observed her go into Miss Moncrief's bedroom and hide this in the back of the bureau drawer. I had a good view through the crack of the door. She then left the house believing herself unobserved. I may say that no one locks their front doors down here and it was dusk. Poirot said to Nurse Harrison, and his voice was hard and venomous. Can you explain these facts? Nurse Harrison? I think not. 
There was no arsenic in that box when it left Messrs. I-95 Woolworth, but there was when it left Miss Bristow's house. He added softly, it was unwise of you to keep a supply of arsenic in your possession. Nurse Harrison buried her face in her hands. She said in a low dull voice. If's true. It's all true. I killed her. And all for nothing. Nothing. I was mad seven Jean Moncrief said. I must ask you to forgive me, M. Poirot. I have been so angry with you so terribly angry with you. It seemed to me that you were making everything so much worse. Poirot said with a smile. So I was to begin with. It is like in the old legend of the Lemine Hydra. Every time a head was cut off, two heads grew in its place. So, to begin with, the rumors grew and multiplied. But you see my task, like that of my namesake Hercules, was to reach the first the original head. Who had started this rumor? It did not take me long to discover that the originator of the story was Nurse Harrison. I went to see her. She appeared to be a very nice woman. Intelligent and sympathetic. But almost at once she made a bad mistake. She repeated to me a conversation which she had overheard taking place between you and the doctor, and that conversation, you see, was all wrong. It was psychologically most unlikely. If you and the doctor had planned together to kill MRS. Oldfield. You are both of you far too intelligent and level-headed to hold such a conversation in a room with an open door, easily overheard by someone on the stairs or someone in the kitchen. Moreover, the words attributed to you did not fit in at all with your mental makeup. They were the words of a much older woman and of one of a quite different type. They were words such as would be imagined by Nurse Harrison as being used by herself in like circumstances. I had up to then, regarded the whole matter as fairly simple. Nurse Harrison, I realized, was a fairly young and still handsome woman. She had been thrown closely with Dr. Oldfield for nearly three years the doctor had been very fond of her and grateful to her for her tact fond of her and grateful to her for her tact that she did not really suffer much pain. But the doctor himself had been in no doubt about the reality of his wife's suffering. He had not been surprised by her death. He had called in another doctor shortly before her death and the other doctor had realized the gravity of her condition. Tentatively I brought forward the suggestion of exhumation. Nurse Harrison was at first frightened out of her doctor had realized the gravity of her condition. Tentatively I brought forward the suggestion of exhumation. Nurse Harrison was at first frightened out of her were you as blind. Mademoiselle. Jean Moncrief said slowly. I have been terribly worried. You see, the arsenic in the poison cupboard didn't tally. Oldfield cried. Jean. You didn't think. Were you as blind? Mademoiselle. Jean Moncrief said slowly. I have been terribly worried. You see, the arsenic in the poison cupboard didn't tally. Oldfield cried. Jean. You didn't think. Poirot said sadly. Tess, she would have made, probably, a good wife and mother. Her emotions were just a little too strong for her. He sighed and murmured once more under his breath. The pity of it. Then he smiled at the happy-looking middle-aged man and the eager-faced girl opposite him. He said to himself. Poirot said sadly. Tess, she would have made, probably, a good wife and mother. Her emotions were just a little too strong for her. He sighed and murmured once more under his breath. The pity of it. Then he smiled at the happy-looking middle-aged man and the eager-faced girl opposite him. He said to himself. These two have come out of its shadow into the sun. And I. I have performed the second labor of Hercules. 101-3 The Arcadian dear Hercule Poirot stamped his feet, seeking to warm them. He blew upon his fingers. 
Flakes of snow melted and dripped from the corners of his mustache. H. There was a knock at the door and a chambermaid appeared. She was a slow-breathing thick-set country girl and she stared with a good deal of curiosity at Hercule Poirot. It was possible that she had never seen anything quite like him before. She asked. Did you ring? I did. Will you be so good as to light the fire? She went out and came back again immediately with paper and sticks. She knelt down in front of the big Victorian grate and began to lay a fire. Hercule Poirot continued to stamp his 102 feet, swing his arms and blow on his fingers. He was annoyed. His car. An expensive Messaro Gratz had not behaved with that mechanical perfection which he expected of a car. His chauffeur, a young man who enjoyed a handsome salary, had not succeeded in putting things right. The car had staged a final refusal in a secondary road a mile and a half from anywhere with a fall of snow beginning. Hercule Poirot, wearing his usual patent leather shoes, had been forced to walk that mile and a half to reach the riverside village of Hartley Dean. A village which, though showing every sign of animation in summertime, was completely more abundant in winter. The black swan had registered something like dismay at the arrival of a guest. The landlord had been almost eloquent as he pointed out that the local garage could supply a car in which the gentleman could continue his journey. Hercule Poirot repudiated the suggestion. His Latin thrift was offended. Hire a car? He already had a car a large car an expensive car. In that car and no other he proposed to continue his journey back to 103 town. And in any case, even if repairs to it could be quickly effected, he was not going on in this snow until next morning. He demanded a room, a fire, and a meal. Sighing, the landlord showed him to the room, sent the maid to supply the fire and then retired to discuss with his wife the problem of the meal. An hour later, his feet stretched out towards the comforting blaze, Hercule Poirot reflected leniently on the dinner he had just eaten. True, the steak had been both tough and full of gristle, the Brussels sprouts had been large, pale, and definitely watery, the potatoes had had hearts of stone. Nor was there much to be said for the portion of stewed apple and custard which had followed. The cheese had been hard, and the biscuits soft. Nevertheless, thought Hercule Poirot, looking graciously at the leaping flames, and sipping delicately at a cup of liquid mud euphemistically called coffee, it was better to be full than empty, and after tramping snowbound lanes in patent leather shoes, to sit in front of a fire was paradise. There was a knock on the door and the chambermaid appeared. An hour later, his feet stretched out towards the comforting blaze, Hercule Poirot reflected leniently on the dinner he had just eaten. True, the steak had been both tough and full of gristle, the Brussels sprouts had been large, pale, and definitely watery, the potatoes had had hearts of stone. Nor was there much to be said for the portion of stewed apple and custard which had followed. The cheese had been hard, and the biscuits soft. Nevertheless, thought Hercule Poirot, looking graciously at the leaping flames, and sipping delicately at a cup of liquid mud euphemistically called coffee, it was better to be full than empty, and after tramping snowbound lanes in patent leather shoes, to sit in front of a fire was paradise. There was a knock on the door and the chambermaid appeared. Her friends would provide entertainment for many winter days to come. There was another knock. A different knock. And Poirot called. Come in. He looked up with approval at the young man who entered and stood there looking ill at ease, twisting his cap in his hands. Here, he thought, was one of the handsomest specimens of humanity he had ever seen, a simple young man with the outward semblance of a Greek god. The young man said in a low husky voice. About the car, sir, we've brought it in and we've got at the trouble. It's a matter of an hour's work or so. Poirot said. What is wrong with it? The young man plunged eagerly into technical details. 
Poirot nodded his head gently, but he was not listening. Perfect physique was a thing he admired greatly. There were, he considered, too many rats in spectacles about. He said to himself approvingly. Yes, a Greek god. A young shepherd in Arcady. The young man stopped abruptly. It was then that Hercule Poirot's brows knitted themselves for a second. His first reaction had been aesthetic, his second mental. His eyes narrowed themselves curiously, as he looked up. He said. I comprehend. Yes, I comprehend. He paused and then added. My chauffeur, he has already told me that which you have just said. He saw the flush that came to the other's cheek, saw the fingers grip the cap nervously. The young man stammered. Yes. E.R. Yes, sir. I know. Hercule Poirot went on smoothly. But you thought that you would also come and tell me yourself. E.R. Yes, sir, I thought I'd better. That, said Hercule Poirot, was very conscientious of you. Thank you. There was a faint but unmistakable note 106 of dismissal in the last words but he did not expect the other to go and he was right. The young man did not move. His fingers moved convulsively, crushing the tweed cap, and he said in a still lower embarrassed voice. E.R. excuse me, sir but it's true, isn't it? that you're the detective gentleman 106 of dismissal in the last words but he did not expect the other to go and he was right. The young man did not move. His fingers moved convulsively, crushing the tweed cap, and he said in a still lower embarrassed voice. E.R. excuse me, sir but it's true, isn't it, that you're the detective gentleman your M.R. Hercules Poirot. He said the name carefully. Poirot said. That is so. Red crept up the young man's face. He said. I read a piece about you in the paper. Yes. The boy was now scarlet. There was distress in his eyes. Distress and appeal. Hercule Poirot came to his aid. He said gently. Yes. What is it you want to ask me? The words came with a rush now. I'm afraid you may think it's awful cheek of me, sir. But you're coming here by chance like this. Well, it's too good to be missed. Having read about you and the clever things you've done. Anyway, I said as after all I might as well ask you. There's no harm in asking, is there? 107 Hercule Poirot shook his head. He said. You want my help in some way, 33 the other nodded. He said, his voice husky and embarrassed. If sits about a young lady. If if you could find her for me. 33 find her? Has she disappeared, then? That's right, sir. 35 Hercule Poirot sat up in his chair. He said sharply. I could help you, perhaps, yes. But the proper people for you to go to are the police. It is their job and they have far more resources at their disposal than I have. Point three. The boy shuffled his feet. He said awkwardly. I couldn't do that, sir. It's not like that at all. It's all rather peculiar, so to speak. Hercule Poirot stared at him. Then he indicated a chair. Eh bien, then, sit down. What is your name? Williamson, sir, Ted Williamson. Sit down, Ted. And tell me all about it. Thank you, sir. He drew forward the 108 chair and sat down carefully on the edge of it. His eyes had still that appealing dog-like look. Hercule Poirot said gently. Tell me. Ted Williamson drew a deep breath. Well, you see, sir, it was like this. I never saw her but the once. And I don't know her right name nor anything. But it's queer like, 
the whole thing, and my letter coming back and everything. Start, said Hercule Poirot, at the beginning. Do not hurry yourself. Just tell me everything that occurred. Yes, sir. Well, perhaps you know Grasslawn, sir, that big house down by the river past the bridge. I know nothing at all. Belongs to Sir George Sanderfield, it does. He uses it in the summertime for weekends and parties. Rather a gay lot he has down as a rule. Actresses and that. Well, it was last June. And the wireless was out of order and they sent me up to see to it. Poirot nodded. So I went along. The gentleman was out on the river with his guests and the 109 cook was out and his manservant had gone along to serve the drinks and all that on the launch. There was only this girl in the house. She was the lady's maid to one of the guests. She let me in and showed me where the set was, and stayed there while I was working on it. And so we got to talking and all that. Nita her name was, so she told me, and she was lady's maid to a Russian dancer who was staying there. What nationality was she, English? No, sir, she'd be French. I think. She'd a funny sort of accent. But she spoke English all right. She she was friendly and after a bit I asked her if she could come out that night and go to the pictures, but she said her lady would be needing her. But then she said as how she could get off early in the afternoon because as how they wasn't going to be back off the river till late. So the long and the short of it was that I took the afternoon off without asking and nearly got the sack for it too, and we went for a walk along by the river. He paused. A little smile hovered on his lips. His eyes were dreamy. Poirot said gently. No and she was pretty, yes. She was just the loveliest thing you ever saw. Her hair was like gold. It went up each side like wings. And she had a gay kind of way of tripping along. I, I well, I fell for her right away, sir. I'm not pretending anything else. Poirot nodded. The young man went on. She said as how her lady would be coming down again in a fortnight and we fixed up to meet again then. He paused. But she never came. I waited for her at the spot she'd said, but not a sign of her and at last I made bold to go up to the house and ask for her. The Russian lady was staying there all right and her maid too, they said. Sent for her, they did, but when she came, why, it wasn't Nita at all. Just a dark catty-looking girl a bold lot if there ever was one. Marie, they called her. You want to see me, she says, simpering all over. She must have seen I was took aback. I said was she the Russian lady's maid and something about her not being the one I'd seen before, and then she laughed and said that the last maid had been sent away sudden. Sent away. I said. What for? She sort of underscore and shrugged her shoulders and stretched out her hands. How should I know, she said. Was not there. Well, sir. It took me aback. At the moment I couldn't think of anything to say. But afterwards I plucked up courage and I got to see this Marie again and asked her to get me Nita's address. I didn't let on to her that I didn't even know Nita's last name. I promised her a present if she did what I asked she was the kind as wouldn't do anything for you for nothing. Well, she got it all right for me an address in North London, it was and I wrote to Nita there but the letter came back after a bit. Sent back through the post office with no longer at this address scrawled on it. Ted Williamson stopped. His eyes, those deep blue steady eyes, looked across at Poirot. He said. You see how it is, sir? It's not a case for the police. But I want to find her. And I don't know how to set about it. If if you could find her for me. His color deepened. I've. I've a bit put by. 
I could manage five pounds. Or even ten. Poirot said gently. 112 SLW We need not discuss the financial side for the moment. First reflect on this point. This girl, this Nita she knew your name and where you worked. Oh yes, sir. She could have communicated with you if she had wanted to. Ted said more slowly. Yes, sir. Then do you not think? Perhaps. Ted Williamson interrupted him. What you're meaning, sir, is that I fell for her but she didn't fall for me. Maybe that's true in a way. But she liked me she did like me. It wasn't just a bit of fun to her. And I've been thinking, sir, as there might be a reason for all this. You see, sir, it was a funny crowd she was mixed up in. She might be in a bit of trouble if you know what I mean. You mean she might have been going to have a child? Your child? N01 mine, sir. Ted flushed. There wasn't nothing wrong between us. Poirot looked at him thoughtfully. He murmured. And if what you suggest is true? You still want to find her? LL3 the color surged up in Ted Williamson's face. He said. Yes, I do, and that's flat. I want to marry her if she'll have me. And that's no matter what kind of a jam she's in. If you'll only try and find her for me, sir. Hercule Poirot smiled. He said, murmuring to himself. CC air like wings of gold. Yes, I think this is the third labor of Hercules. If I remember rightly, that happened in Arcady. LL3 the color surged up in Ted Williamson's face. He said. Yes, I do, and that's flat. I want to marry her if she'll have me. And that's no matter what kind of a jam she's in. If you'll only try and find her for me, sir. Hercule Poirot smiled. He said, murmuring to himself. CC air like wings of gold. Yes, I think this is the third labor of Hercules. If I remember rightly, that happened in Arcady. Woman with bleary eyes opened the door to Poirot's knock. 114 Miss Valletta, 33 gone away a long time ago, she has. Poirot advanced a step into the doorway just as the door was about to close. You can give me, perhaps, her address, 33 couldn't say, I'm sure. She didn't leave 1.33 when did she go away, 33 last summer it was.33 can you tell me exactly when, 33 a gentle clinking noise came from Poirot's right hand where two half crowns jostled each other in friendly fashion. The bleary eyed woman softened in an almost magical manner. She became graciousness itself. Well. I'm sure I'd like to help you, sir. Let me see now. August, no, before that. July yes, July it must have been. About the first week in July. Went off M.A. hurry, she did. Back to Italy, I believe.33 she was an Italian, then, 33 that's right, sir.33 and she was at one time ladies maid to a Russian dancer was she not, 33 that's right. Madame Simolina or some such name. Danced at the thespian II-5 in this bally everyone's so wild about. One of the stars, she was. Poirot said. Do you know why Miss Valletta left her post? The woman hesitated a moment before saying. I couldn't say, I'm sure. She was dismissed, was she not. Well, I believe there was a bit of a dust up. But mind you, Miss Valletta didn't let on much about it. She wasn't one to give things away. But she looked wild about it. Wicked temper she had real idly in her black eyes all snapping and looking as if she'd like to put a knife into you. I wouldn't have crossed her when she was in one of her moods. 
and you are quite sure you do not know Miss Valletta's present address. The half-crowns clinked again encouragingly. No Miss Valletta's present address. The half-crowns clinked again encouragingly. I wish I did, sir. I'd be only too glad to tell you. But there. She went off in a hurry and there it is. Poirot said to himself thoughtfully. Yes, there it is. Il Ambrose Vandal, diverted from his enthusiastic account of the décor he was designing for a forthcoming ballet, supplied information easily enough. Sanderfield? George Sanderfield? Nasty fellow. Rolling in money but they say he's a crook. Dark horse. Affair with a dancer? But of course, my dear. He had an affair with Katrina. Katrina Samishinksa. You must have seen her. Oh, my dear too delicious. Lovely technique. The swan of Tolela you must have seen that. My décor. And that other thing of Debussy or is it Manin la bitch au bois? She danced it with Michael Novgen. He's so marvelous, isn't he? And she was a friend of Sir George Sanderfield. Yes, she used to weekend with him at his house on the river. Marvelous parties I believe he gives. Would it be possible, Monday Cher, for you to introduce me to Mademoiselle Samishinksa? But, my dear, she isn't here any longer. She went to Paris or somewhere quite EII7 suddenly. You know, they do say that she was a Bolshevik spy or something not that I believed it myself you know people love saying things like that. Katrina always pretended that she was a white Russian her father was a prince or a grand duke the usual thing. It goes down so much better. Vandal paused and returned to the absorbing subject of himself. Now as I was saying, if you want to get the spirit of Bathsheba you've got to steep yourself in the Semitic tradition. I express it by. He continued happily. And she was a friend of Sir George Sanderfield. Yes, she used to weekend with him at his house on the river. Marvelous parties I believe he gives. Would it be possible, Monday Cher, for you to introduce me to Mademoiselle Samishinksa? But, my dear, she isn't here any longer. She went to Paris or somewhere quite EII7 suddenly. You know, they do say that she was a Bolshevik spy or something not that I believed it myself you know people love saying things like that. Katrina always pretended that she was a white Russian her father was a prince or a grand duke the usual thing. It goes down so much better. Vandal paused and returned to the absorbing subject of himself. Now as I was saying, if you want to get the spirit of Bathsheba you've got to steep yourself in the Semitic tradition. I express it by. He continued happily. Did not start too auspiciously. The dark horse, as Ambrose Vandal had called him, was slightly ill at ease. Sir George was a short square man with dark coarse hair and a roll of fat in his neck. He said. Well, M. Poirot. What can I do for you? ER. We haven't met before, I think. N0, we have not met. 118 well, what is it? I confess, I'm quite curious.30, it is very simple. A mere matter of information. The other gave an uneasy laugh. Want me to give you some inside dope, eh? Didn't know you were interested in finance.33 It is not a matter of lay affairs. It is a question of a certain lady. Oh, a woman. Sir George Sanderfield leant back in his armchair. He seemed to relax. His voice held an easier note. Poirot said. You were acquainted, I think, with Mademoiselle Katrina Samishinksa. Sanderfield laughed. Yes. An enchanting creature. Pity she's left London. Why did she leave London? My dear fellow, slash don't know. Row with the management, I believe. 
She was temperamental, you know. Very Russian in her moods. I'm sorry that I can't help you but I haven't the least idea where she is now. I haven't kept up with her at all. There was a note of dismissal in his voice as he rose to his feet. LOH 9119 Poirot said. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.